been? Week? I don't even know what day it is. Um, is it Thursday? Yes, it's same, Thursday. Same time, same place as last week. <laughs> It's been a bit a bit up and down, I would say, like probably other people as well, finding it we've got another three weeks. How did we find it we had another three weeks? Even that, it's just like, I don't know. It all goes into one. It was Thursday. They told us on Thursday because I was waiting for it on Monday. And uh, So was that a week ago today that we found out it was going to must be? Have been. Yeah, it must have been. must have been a week ago because, yeah, two weeks ago we're supposed to be in lockdown until the 7th of... Um, so yes so i don't know I, my week goes in terms of the only one thing i really know that i do is i get my mom and dad shopping round about this time of the week that's <laughs> funny. Uh, and that's about it so um i don't know about other people who are listening to this but i've found this week quite hard i think probably because initially it was like the three weeks and i was like no nah, can cope with that and i had that sort of grieving process i think the first couple of weeks uh, and the reality mm -hmm. of it and then got my head around the fact that it was probably creating a wee bubble for me and my daughter, which was fine. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't think I would be so affected by the fact that we've been told that this is going to continue for some time and we're not going to be able to go and do anything that we really want to do, the things that nurture us really, um, and that we're going to have to continue living a sort of more online life. And I think that's probably what's hit me this week is I'm missing people. I'm really missing people now and I'm missing like connection and I'm a real cuddler like I'm quite a, a, a touchy feely type person so I need some um, oxytocin that's how I get my oxytocin when I go and cuddle my parents yeah. and I've got a 17 year old teenage daughter who doesn't do a lot of cuddling anymore <laughs> gone are the days where we used to snuggle up together so uh, yeah I'm looking for ways of how to get that probably from other places so I'm starting my yoga again and things like that so I think that's probably what I'm yearning. My body's yearning some of that um, connection, the real life connection. And I was actually watching, I think, I don't know what if it was the Scottish news. I, I stay away from the news deliberately because I think it just feeds your monkey, it feeds your own demons. And I think we have to create our own version of our reality that we'll, we're living in. And I don't need the television to tell me how I should be feeling. But I happened to have it on in the background and there was people in the meadows in Edinburgh and there was an old lady and she was like, I live on my own and I'm finding it really hard. And I was like, oh. And then there was another lady who was probably about the same age as me and she was like, I'm, I live on my own and I'm finding it really difficult because I want to have human connection and it's okay to zoom in, it's okay doing what we were doing just now and connect in that sort of a way. But it just, it just feels like, oh, if we're really going to have to do a lot of social distancing for the remainder of this year till we get a vaccine, so, oh, I'm really going to miss people, like just being in the same room. I'm, I'm a, em, well, I'm an empath, and so I pick up lots of energy from people anyway. But um, I, I was a extrovert. It's probably how we, I did my Myers Briggs when I was in my corporate life, right? And I was told that I was an ENFP. Um, but I was like, when I read, it, I was like, oh my god, have you been in my living room? That's really that is how I live my life. Like that's me. <laughs> um. And I do pick up the energy of other people. I, I like, I miss that. I think my soul misses that when I've not got, and there's only so much I think we can do online and get that level of connection, I think. I don't know, what do you think about that? Well, that's interesting you say that because last night when I was walking the dog, Annette, um, Annette Hislop, same name as me, lives in the States. She's a therapist and she called to talk about attachment and to dig a bit deeper around attachment theory. And she'd sent me a really interesting article, which was attachment to God or your attachment to God. Now, whatever God might mean, right? Um, when you say that word, a lot of people's toes curl up, but mm -hmm. I mean, I personally believe in I believe in collective consciousness, being a therapist, I, I, I adhere to that. And I believe in a field of consciousness, a field of intelligence that is probably far more supremely intelligent than I could ever understand what it is. So I do my best not to try and understand it. Mm -hmm. And my belief around that 
is that I believe that we came from source. Uh, you, you mentioned your soul was missing that. So I think my soul came from source at one point and then I was born. And was I born into a unified field of consciousness or was I born into, was I born into separation consciousness? Well, that's debatable. But I think I was more connected to source as a child than I was as an adolescent or mm -hmm. indeed as an adult. So I believe that it starts to become a question of morality as well when you start to go a bit deeper into that. But I believe that trauma can only occur because we have disconnected from a unified field of consciousness. I believe that if an individual was completely working from a unified field of consciousness and somebody attacked them, but I doubt that that attack would occur if you were in a full, full, full unified field of consciousness, but if you were attacked and you were feeling completely connected, I don't believe that that attack would have any residual impact on you. I don't believe there would be a trauma. I believe that the trauma comes because we're disconnected. Yeah. So that's my belief system, and um, I don't expect people to agree with me. Uh, I've got freedom of speech, and I'm allowed to think that, and allowed to say that. <laughs> so I then we were talking about. So it's almost the example that I gave to Annette last night was that somebody once said to me that. If you are an emotional eater and you got bad news and you ate a lasagna and a cream pie and then you get more bad news and every time you get bad news you ate a particular type of food, then when you go on a diet to cleanse that, each pound that was put on by the emotion that you absorbed, you have to process the emotion when you're taking it off. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. yep. So... It's almost like in order, so the disconnection, so if I'm a hundred steps away from a unified self, a fully connected self, then in, the reason why I became a hundred steps away from a unified self was multiple trauma in my childhood, um, a childhood where I was hypervigilant, a place where I didn't feel safe and didn't have a lot of attachment, right? So I've stepped away and then my life's just progressively yeah. making mm -hmm. lots of trauma. Mm -hmm. So then in order for me to reconnect to that unified field, I would have to go through the, the broken bonding. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, it totally makes so sense. <laughs> you, asked me the question, you asked me the question and Annette and I were talking about that last night and that's my take on it is... Um, would we need people, places and things if we were 100% working from source? And I think that a lot of New Age Hay House authors are talking about this, but I genuinely don't think there's very few people on our planet that have. A lot of people are talking about awakening and, oh, are you woke and awakened state <laughs> of consciousness? Well, if you were in an awakened state of consciousness, you wouldn't talk about an awakened state of consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. And there's people that are proclaiming that they're awake. And a local coach here, I had a client last week that I spent two hours on the phone with because they've been following a coach that is promoting Q, deep state, the Trump. You know, all of these conspiracy theories, this person is a coach and he is supposedly, I don't know because I don't know the person, but I had a client that was in extreme anxiety because he's following this coach's post who proclaims that he's awakened, but he's sharing conspiracy theories continually with people that are on his list, mm -hmm. right? So from that perspective, if you were in an awakened state of consciousness, you wouldn't need to tell people you were in an awakened state of consciousness. <laughs> and you wouldn't also be getting involved in conspiracy theories either because you would be beyond it, which then brings to memory, and this is about you, not me, and I've been talking for 10 minutes, 
but um, <laughs> it was it was i remember reading about ram das who had been experimenting with lsd and he went to his sadhu in india and said to the sadhu that he had found enlightenment and it was in this bottle with the bottle was full of lsd and the sadhu just nodded his head and went okay and ram das was selling it and the sadhu went like that and took the lid off the bottle and drank the lot and there was enough for a hundred people <laughs> and it never it never touched the sadhu because the sadhu was in a place that was beyond mm -hmm. where any external drug could have took him to so attachment how do we get back to a place where we feel mm -hmm. safe enough where we don't feel isolated alone and in the heart so anyway I back to you i can know i think it's really really interesting because i think what's happening with, with this pandemic and the lockdown is actually making us face what you've just said that disconnect so it's actually interesting that you should say that because then i just mentioned to you before we came online that i'd listened to a podcast with brandy brown who had mentioned in the talk oh, last week about loneliness so it kind of comes at this what that whole discussion was about how could we be lonely and the gentleman who she was talking to is a doctor and I think he was some, I want to say Surgeon General. Do they have them in America? Surgeon um, General? Maybe. Yeah, I, th I think he was the Surgeon General for America. Um, and he's written a book and it's, it's about loneliness. Um, it's about what he discovered during his research and all the times. And it was disconnection from self was actually what, he's, what he was really saying, right? So he was kind of talking in academic intellectual language but what he, i didn't listen to all because i was getting ready for this call um and he said there's three different kinds of loneliness you know we need to have three different types of uh, dimensions of connections what he said one is i've written it down because i was wanting to talk about it one was intimate and emotional connection like with the, the people that you're intimate with and uh, one was <coughs> excuse me relational and social so it's about friendships and then the third one was collective community, so about the wider connection you have with the people around about you. Um, because Brenny Brown was saying, sometimes the loneliest times I've had have been in a room with the people that I love the most. Mm -hmm. um, and and he said, she said, he was saying there's a lot of shame around loneliness and admitting that you're lonely. Um, so that, that kind of sort of feeds into what we're talking about just now, I suppose, in terms of that disconnection from self. But it's not just to be... I'm not disconnected with myself. I think I'm really in touch with myself. So what you've said there has made me think, oh, Mark, am I so detached from myself that I'm that I'm lonely? I'm not. I'm actually just missing the people around about me. So it's it's okay for me to to miss them, I think. Because my human experience, I think there is a collective consciousness, but I do think that we have a human experience to live. You know, and mm -hmm. I think that... Um, Yes, there's a collective consciousness. We're bigger. We're part of something much bigger. Somebody can be doing something in the way over in the spider's web in the India somewhere, ping their spider's web, and we feel it in the ripple effect over here. Absolutely believe in that. And that's why I've sort of done all David Hamilton's done all this sort of spiritual and scientific blend. I've tried to understand that from my point of view. Um, but I do think there's there's elements of a humanness about how we live our lives. Like, I do believe that we're connected to source, that we're, I think we're brought down here for a reason and we've got to, there's lots for us to learn. Mm. We've got to re, rediscover and, and, and un, unpick those. The journey is, is like being born that beautiful. That's why I like the Inside Out movie and I talk to the kids that I work with about Inside Out, right? Oh, and nice. I cried the whole way through that movie. Have you ever seen the Inside Out movie? Yeah, loads oh. of times. Oh my god, I, I love it because and Linda, I know Linda Fennis is listening to this. So if you're listening, Linda, this is this is for you too, because it's about the white light and it starts off with one tiny wee cell of energy. If you ever go back to the film and watch it at the very beginning, and it's this tiny, tiny, tiny wee white light uh, that starts off the movie. And that was the minute I started crying. I was like, oh my god, this is just like the best film ever. And then all these things are made of energy, they're all glowing and they're all moving and they're all made of tiny wee like pits of energy and I'm like oh my god I just love that film because it's the 
And like we said, you know, you're in that state in your brain when you're till you're seven years old and then that experiences is what you become as an adult and you're talking about the disconnection from self. And I do believe that that's the whole journey is like as we become adults is to not muck our kids up, not muck ourselves up too badly and then come back to the whole journey is coming back to learning who we are, like mm -hmm. what we are. And, and, and this search in general was the three things about loneliness, about the three dimensions. And he said, what we're not very good at is the being. Like as humans, we've got to get the being part done before we do the doing. So we've got to learn how to be before we can then get on and do the doing because it's the being part that gets in the way of doing the doing. And I said, yep. oh, I just loved that. I was like, yeah. So yep. I suppose what I'm talking about is, is I'm missing that connection with the people that I love, like the people around about me. Like I actually FaceTimed my friend um, who I've not seen for a month um, I, I FaceTime Linda, my friend, on here often, so I've, I'm used to us connecting that way and we're, we're really close anyway, but there's one person that I haven't spoken to and just seeing her face this week, I burst into tears and I was like, oh my goodness, where did that come from? So I'm clearly there's something coming up for me about th that, missing that, being able to go for a coffee with her and she's very spiritual and she's way off doing things and she's, she's quite vivacious and she's, she's really aligning with her own true self and I love to be around people who are who are doing that heavy work you know the heavy lifting um so I'm, I miss that um and it's not I'm not waking up in the morning going oh my god I'm so bereft I've not seen my pals I'm not seeing that at all I think what's coming up for me in isolation and being away from people is I'm having to look at that those dark aspects and find that in myself and in the, in the happy moments like today I was in the garden with Millie my daughter and just the sun on my face I was like oh this is just so nice like this is so nice but I've still got my wee mind monkeys going yeah that's not that's not all though really is it <laughs> that's not everything that's not what you really want um and it is for now it is in that moment so I think learning how to be more mindful um is what I'm supporting my families through at the moment actually the families that I'm working with and what's really interesting, right, is that there's two families I'm working with at the moment in particular who the both parents work and they're really, really busy and they've got quite full on jobs when they come home they're knackered and they're really tired and they have children who they might say have additional support needs. But what's coming up for them now because they're not so busy is that um, there's a couple of things probably that their desire for things to be different at home and they, they, the reality of the fact that they have a huge impact on how things might have been before. Uh, that busyness in life has got in the way that has not allowed them to perhaps see some of the solutions that were already underneath their, their own noses. Um, and it's also putting the mirror back on themselves to say, right, how are you in terms of what we're asking of our own children in terms of being able to emotionally regulate, um, knowing what to do when your amygdala is in hijack, like knowing what to do in that particular moment for ourselves as well as for our children, because adults have got to stop hiding. Like we were chatting at the weekend, weren't we, in terms of what we were going to talk about this week. And I said, whenever I talk, it's got to be raw and real. I'm not one for any bullshit. So if you're not honest with me, I can smell it a mile off. And and that's that's the kind of connection that my soul wants is is real true honest connection with people who 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 are in to do the heavy lifting, <laughs> um, who are really wanting to do the hard work. Um, so yeah, I don't. I kind of feel like I'm rambling now, but I don't know where that came from. But yeah, I think that's probably what I'm saying here is I want I'm missing that connection with people who are on the same deep dive into life and really wanting to get their hands dirty and and if something comes up for them they're not blaming someone else and they're taking responsibility and they're accountable for themselves absolutely um, yeah so that's the sort of reparenting side that i really am intrigued about um and i'm definitely going to develop more work on that for my parents is to help them to help themselves Having a way off there when you you triggered something in you when you were talking about heavy heavy lifting and heavy lading and you know does that give us an does that give us because does that give us a sense of importance 
the, uh, the, the bigger the catharsis or the harder the session or the more difficult it was to get, that it means that it gives more meaning to it. No. Why, 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 why when you, why when you, why when you give your work away for free, do people not get it, whereas the ones <laughs> that pay for it do? Mm -hmm. oh, and it's back to that. And the, what, what it triggered in me was, I went, away, I went away off thinking, and it's like the Old Testament would say the only way to the Lord is through suffering. And, you know, it has to be difficult. It's got to be a difficult slog. You've got to really get in touch with that pain. And then the New Testament came along and Jesus came along and said, to hang with that old stagger, I'm your direct link. Just believe in me and you will go out and do even greater things than I have done. It's not a struggle. It's just open your heart and step forward. But we're still functioning from an old paradigm, an ancient primordial paradigm where we think it has to be hard. I think it has to be hard. I'm not disagreeing with you. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering why I'm still thinking it has to be hard. It can be easy. The difficult bit about it is believing a hundred percent as if it's already happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Just and actually, I think we're both triggering each other because when you said that, I have had an occasion, and, and it's funny because I know Linda's listening. She'll be laughing and up her sleeve. Um, I have had a, just maybe a couple of occasions when something big's come up for me and it has been easy. It's like the easiest thing, easiest realisation to go, oh my God. Like, like actually, I was thinking about my, my subconscious, obviously, if you like the physics of this, like which universe are we in? There's a parallel universe. There's such a thing as deja vu. But I obviously knew I was going to talk about this. And I won't talk about it because it's very personal, but there was something for me that was a real driver. Like for a long time, I would say for 20 odd years, it was a huge thing. And I didn't realise it was a driver till I no longer had to prove to myself that I was this type of a person. Right. It was a huge thing. It was massive. Very few people on this earth know about the thing that I'm talking about. And um, I was like, oh, my God. And then when you take away that pressure, that internal pressure that you actually didn't even realise was there, it is easy. Like, it's totally easy. It's too easy, though, because we've made it so freaking difficult for ourselves. From the time you get into your 40s and you realise you've made this thing so much bigger than it actually was, and you didn't, you only were the person you were ever in battle with was yourself. And then all of a sudden that completely changes and you're like, <gasps> and of course, for me, there was tears because the realisation was enormous but even like the, from that moment my life changed, completely changed in a nanosecond and it wasn't something that I had to well I wouldn't say I had to dig deep but there was, because I was perpetually motivated by this particular thing, the minute it disappeared, I was almost like uh, what now? Like I don't have that driver to prove anything to myself because I I know it's bullshit and I know that I'm great. Like, I really like myself now. It's taken me a long time to be able to say that. But this thing had pushed me and driven me from inside because of decisions that I'd made previously in my life. That it's like, so that, that when you triggered me, it was like, yeah, you're right. Because when you're open, you talked as well about Lucy and you did actually mention it in the last week for me, it's about living with an open heart especially in these particular times, learning how to live an open heart and allowing yourself to just move through the emotions. That's what we need to get really good at, is that it doesn't have to be hard when we know we're going to be doing a bit of this all the time. And I keep talking about Dr. David Hamilton, but I remember having a coffee with him once and he, he was we were talking about him mentoring men and stuff. And he says, Leslie, it's actually just learning how to go with the waves. Like if we, if you learn how to do that, then your growth and the acceptance of self is much, much easier because then you're not really in battle with yourself. So I think you're right. That particular huge thing came and was easy to, to realise because I was ready. I was open-minded. I was open-hearted and it was the right time for me to, to do that. So that huge revelation was easy. Sometimes... <laughs> Like we make it really hard to do the smallest of things, though. 
Like we make it like a bullshit story we make up in our head about why we shouldn't do things. It's just uh, all boils down to the same thing, which is learning how to be ourselves. And Absolutely. So but, I can't quote the Bible like the way that you do. So when when you talked about the New Testament and Jesus coming along and saying, "Do like just follow me and we'll make it easy," I think there's an element of truth in that. And I'd like to see Linda's comments because Linda will know how she feels about this when the video's finished. But I almost feel when you said that for me, it felt like that's where we where we're going. That's where we're learning how to get to. Like we, that's we're learning. The thing is, we're already there. Yeah, yeah, the the barriers to the human experience that thinks that we're not there. We're already there. Yeah. Uh, Two thousand and twenty years ago, we're just, <laughs> you know, and as you were talking there as well, I I I a chap I know um who's doing great work in his self right now, we darn, he put a thing up and it was talking about the second brain, mm -hmm. and now the gut, now the gut, the enteric nervous system and the gut, that's the second brain. Yeah. Was it the second brain? Second to what? Second mm -hmm. to that. So you're giving that all the credence? No. So this is the first brain, is it? Whereas that has got an intuitive, instinctive, innate intelligence. There's kilos of microbes in that gut that builds your immune system. Those microbes, when you look at them under microscope, have an innate intelligence that's beyond any intelligence you could understand. So is that your second brain? But your heart's got neural networks in it as well. So what's that your first brain? So now we're measuring, now we've got, this is your first brain. So that's won the race, that's the powerful brain. And then your second brain, well, it's second to it. And then your heart, well, oh, that's third to it. Oh, so who told us that? How do we know what one's really the first brain? What if we, you know, the world was flat up until the 1700s. <laughs> you know, what if our heart was our first brain? Mm -hmm. But what we've done is we've given credence over the last 20,000 years to language and linguistics, which has completely shut us off from our body. What if what if we led from the heart? What if we opened our heart like what Jesus, what many great prophets have said, and we started to, which is vulnerability, because in order to go into your heart, even to talk about this as a male, it's like, well, what's he rattling on about? But you know, it's like, wow, keep it mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. step, step into your paradigm, step into your holiday where your heart's open and you're communicating with your environment from your heart. And as Jesus said, believe in what I say and you will go out and do even greater things than I could do. So some of the, you're right. And some of the things that I talk to my, my parents about, because the, the, a lot of the parents that I talk to are in conflict with themselves as well as with their children, with the environment round about them, with social status, with lack of money, with poverty. Mm -hmm. And and when I say to them, they're like, but what should I do when me, Johnny's just shouting at me? And I'm I'm like, he's communicating, like he's got an unmet need. And they're like, oh. And I'm like, just drop into your heart and ask yourself what would love to you. And, and some of them are like, oh. And they know what love would do. Right? And other ones don't want to hear that. And I, I'll still say it regardless, because I think that that's the answer. And I said it to you in the video last Thursday as well, is that we always do, we do actually know how to parent as children. We're just scared to parent the way that we, we, we because it's, it's the mother's myth, the myth of the mother that Lucy was talking about. And we can't possibly diss, you said you can't shove your granny off the bus or your mum, right? So it's okay for us to to not want to parent the way that we were previously parented ourselves and to to not disrespect our parents in the process mm -hmm. so if we have to drop in our heart and say what we'd love to and the response is to a completely different paradigm from how we were parented that's actually okay and you need to give yourself permission and i i i often drop into my heart and respond to situations from that place because my brain isn't that compassionate Right, and my heart is my heart is very compassionate. I'm the most compassionate, loving, caring person, but my intellectual brain thinks it knows better, mm -hmm. and it really it really doesn't. <laughs> Sometimes it does, uh, very rarely. But that's where I also think my intuition comes from. Like the gut, 
and my heart, like my soul connection is here in my body. You can't, my other hand's down in my solar plexus. So I think that's where, and if I, if I'm talking about mothers, through the people that I work with, if we follow our intuition as mothers and we come from that part of ourselves, mm-hmm. then we're going to have a much better bond and connection with our children. And ourselves. And pardon? And ourselves. And ourselves, absolutely, because we're trusting ourselves. We're not second guessing ourselves, and, and I think that's where women think that they can't, they can't follow their hearts and they can't do the things that they want to do is because they're intellectually trying to sort a situation out with their heart and souls. Like for God's sake, they're almost knocking. Hello, we're down here. Can you come and connect with us, please? Because actually, from here is where we're, where our joy comes from. So I think I'm listening to my own words this week. So when you said how are you doing, and I'm like, I'm a wee bit pissed off. I'm going to be really honest. Um. And I think I need to connect with my own intuition. And my intuition is actually telling me to not put new work out um, and to retreat somewhat into myself. Um, and I was saying that to Linda as well, that I almost feel like I'm retreating further than, mm-hmm. in, than lockdown. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's OK. I'm OK with that because I'm listening to myself because that must be what I need. So even though I'm talking to you about loneliness and about missing connection, what my intuition is telling me is you don't need it from anybody else. You need it from yourself. Like, just connect yes. with yourself. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> we can finish now. I've got, that was my wee bit of therapy. Thanks for that, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It was lovely to see you. And, uh, um, oh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. And as, we, as I said, I actually I spoke over the fence. I know you need to go. I spoke over the fence to my new neighbours that have just bought the house next door and they're lovely. And there's absolutely no agenda from me at all from doing these. But if one person gets one thing that makes sense to them, that gives them that light bulb moment, that makes them change one tiny little thing, and it's the mustard seed. Mm -hmm. It was the original quantum physicist, that man. He puts puts Joe Dispenser to shame. Oh, really? Oh, that's another conversation from another time. Uh, and <laughs> one person could get something out of our chat tonight, then our work is done. It is. And actually, I think it, what's really interesting about chatting to you, Ross, is that there are triggers that happen both for yourself and for the people that you're talking to and speaking to me tonight as well. And I seem to realise things and also sharing stuff that's really quite deep and personal, I think. People think when you're any kind of therapist and you work in any sort of caring role or anything like that, that you've all got your shit together. Absolutely not. And I think raw and real conversations make it okay for people to be finding their own way as well during these times. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic night and I'll be thinking of you when I'm clapping at 8 o'clock. Okay, right. You take care. You You take care.